All right, next up is the talk that I think a lot of you have been waiting eagerly for. No pressure, Rob. Um, the Dymos tutorial. Hopefully, some of you feel like you know Kung Fu now. Um, but uh, definitely ask questions as we go here. That's probably, there's, there's going to be a lot thrown at you. So um, better to get clarification now and then go back and look later rather than try to necessarily follow along. All right. So my name's Rob Falk. I um, started here at NASA Glenn about 20 years ago now, uh, doing mission analysis uh, for spacecraft mission design. Um, got into uh, more of the software details as far as some of the trajectory optimization techniques go and kind of fell in love with that. Um, I worked for a long time on the Otis trajectory optimization software, which is uh, kind of one of NASA's uh, standard trajectory optimization tools that uses a pseudo-spectral method. Um, a few years ago, Justin approached me and said, you know, we'd like to do some uh, dynamic analysis under OpenMDAO. And so out of that eventually came Dimos, which is um, in a lot of ways is flavored by Otis. It, it has uh, some of the same uh, interface uh, kind of uh, notions as, as Otis. Um, but we're also trying to improve upon what was already there. What I'm not trying to do is recreate, just have another trajectory optimization tool because there are so many. But I am trying uh, to do one that, that plays well with OpenMDAO. And I'm also uh, trying to, to, to use, use the features of OpenMDAO to perhaps do things that other tools can't do yet. <clears throat> so uh, Dimos is an open source library for modeling uh, dynamic systems in OpenMDAO uh, with support for multiple optimal control techniques. Um, one of the important things to me is that uh, it doesn't impose the trajectory optimization as the top level problem in the system. Uh, with Otis, some of the things that we're trying to do, I, I think I mentioned there in the, in the last bullet, uh, one of the things I'm always interested in is I don't want to know the best uh, trajectory a system can fly necessarily. I want to co-design the trajectory and, and the system in a coupled way such that we find the best system that a, uh, or that uh, to fly a given trajectory or the best vehicle designed to fly a given trajectory and the best trajectory that can be flown by that system. So in that way, this is a coupled problem. Um, uh, we can do that uh, in the past and other tools do do that. You can parameterize your vehicle design and say, well, if I have this much mass on board or if this much propellant on board, then the size of my propellant tanks, you know, the, the mass of my propellant tanks increases, et cetera. Um, but what's difficult to do is a very detailed design. So we usually leave that kind of parameterized at the trajectory level. What I wanted uh, with Dimos is to say, no, we're just going to solve one open MDAO optimization of which the trajectory or multiple trajectories will be part of the larger system. And we're trying to essentially optimize this, this overall system and not just a, a single part, uh, a single piece of it. Uh, so Dimos leverages the strengths of OpenMDAO, uh, most important of which to me is the analytic derivatives and the automatic detection of sparsity patterns. Um, since OpenMDAO allows for adjoint differentiation, that tends to be faster when you apply a shooting method. That is, you start, you know uh, you're solving essentially the initial value problem. You know where you're starting, you know a control profile, you know the time for which you want to propagate. You say go. Your 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 vehicle or your system propagates forward in time, and then you say, hey, did that satisfy my constraints? If it didn't, you come back and and reguess your control profile, reguess your uh, time of integration. That sort of system tends to have only a few uh, design variables: the initial state of the vehicle and all the the, the controls in time. Um, on the other hand, the pseudo spectral methods. Uh, which I'll get into in a bit more, uh, they have uh, a lot of design variables and a lot of constraints. The Jacobians there tend to be on the order of squarish. Uh, because of that, they're usually not faster in adjoint mode. They're usually faster in forward mode. Um, what One of the things uh, that we did in our SciTech paper last year is that we showed a lot of times you work with people who aren't interested in taking the time to integrate their analysis tool into something like a pseudo spectral method where you're aware of the sparsity and everything. They just say, give me your trajectory. I'm going to tell you along that trajectory whether you're violating constraints. Uh, so kind of like a post-processing type step. When you do that, you essentially are adding a new constraint to your Jacobian that's potentially dependent on the entirety of the trajectory, on all of your variables. So what that does is add this new uh, 
uh, dense row to, uh, uh, to your Jacobian. Pseudospectral methods historically have always had dense columns because things like your time or design variables can potentially impact everything at every point along the trajectory. If, um, and, but we could make use, we could still essentially do coloring. Uh, we did a more manual coloring uh, with things like Otis and tools like SOX and, and GPOPs, or at least back in the day. Um, uh, they did a more manual coloring. Now, if I introduce this, this uh, dense row into the Jacobian, I've obliterated my coloring. I can't efficiently simultaneously compute two things. But because of the, the way in which uh, OpenMDAO can compute derivatives, it can compute the ones in forward mode uh, that are efficient to, to simultaneously compute in forward mode. And then it goes back through and says, oh, and then after the fact, I'm going to compute this one essentially in adjoint mode and, and, and replace that. And because of that, you can get the best of both worlds. You can interact with people who don't care to rewrite their code for pseudospectral methods, and you'll still get good performance. Um, so those, uh, I think right now, those are, are probably the highlights of OpenMDO as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we do utilize parallelization of, of expensive models via MPI. I uh, admittedly do not use that as much, um, but it is uh, something that we're definitely working towards uh, making as easy as possible. And then lastly, the access to solvers, uh, OpenMDO solvers within the ODE. So I think John was showing uh, balanced flight equations. We've done a lot of work where we would use uh, what in trajectory optimization we sometimes call uh, a um, differential inclusion technique, where what would traditionally be a control variable uh, in terms of something like angle of attack and thrust, instead we effectively pose the altitude and velocity profiles in time as the control variables. And then and the, and essentially say this trajectory is true. What alpha and uh, thrust values make this trajectory true? And it's a different way of solving problems. In some cases, it has some benefits, and we've used it uh, with a good deal of success in analyzing uh, uh, aircraft problems. And also, before I go on, if anyone that wants to interrupt. Uh, feel free to interrupt, ask me a question. If you're going to throw fruit, make sure it's ripe and we'll be <laughs> fine. Um, so the numerical methods uh, that Dimos uses right now, I've written it intentionally to be very general and essentially allow one single interface to a variety of methods. Um, right now, we support two pseudospectral methods, the high order gauss lobato technique, which is uh, what was uh, developed in Otis. I'll talk about a little bit about that more later. And then the Radal pseudospectral method, which is in GPOPs and I believe also Dido, although I admittedly don't have as much experience with Dido. Um, uh, shooting methods, uh, we do have an RK4 in there right now, but we also have solver-based pseudospectral methods uh, that I'll go into and I'll give a demonstration of. Honestly, I think my preference right now would be to go with the solver-based pseudospectral methods and maybe not worry about the RK method just because the interface is not, it, it's difficult to maintain if we add features, uh, those two very different transcription types, whereas the pseudospectral trans, uh, transcriptions are, are much more consistent with one another and give you essentially the same behavior. Uh, so the problem that Dimos is effectively helping you solve is to minimize or maximize uh, some objective quantity subject to uh, dynamics. And we call the variables that we're integrating states, which collides with MDAO. And there's so many name collisions between our two disciplines that it drives me crazy. But that's uh, so, but we would call those the state dynamics that we're integrating. Um, dynamic controls, which are control variables that can take on different values uh, throughout uh, throughout the flight. So this would be something like your steering angles. Static controls are sometimes called design parameters. We call them des design parameters. Those are things that you set once up front, either at the trajectory level or within a single phase of the trajectory. And they don't change uh, throughout that entire trajectory in the case of the trajectory design parameters or throughout the phase in the case of the phase design parameters. Uh, boundary constraints are constraints that are uh, imposed at the beginning and end of a of a portion of the trajectory that we call a phase. Um, so if you, if you wanna pin your initial value or your final value at some portion of the flight uh, to a known desired value, that's how you would do it. And then path constraints are basically, uh, we, we used to call those placards in older versions of Otis. They're the velocity not to exceed or, or things like that, where you know never throughout the trajectory shall you exceed these values. 
Um, so as I said, the, the Dimos user interface is heavily influenced by Otis. Um, a trajectory is broken up into one or more phases. And then in each phase, uh, states or controls are represented by one or more polynomial segments in time. And this might sound a little confusing in just text, but I'm going to get into some, gra to some graphics later that'll ho hopefully make it more clear. Um, you can link phases be via constraint. So you can say, uh, you can optimize this trajectory. I don't care what you do, but at the end of the optimization, the initial value of altitude in this phase has to equal the final value of altitude in, in, in this phase. And that's one way in which we can link trajectories together. We also do support um, in OpenMDO fashion, just straight linking, you know, the output of this trajectory feeds into the input of this trajectory. Uh, the dis disadvantage of doing that is that um, you can't parallelize then those two uh, phase uh, analyses. <clears throat> and then our phase linkages are also very general. So if you have a branching trajectory or a trajectory that includes, for instance, a nominal, uh, a nominal launch vehicle ascent, but then you also want to take into account something like a flyback bo booster, like we saw earlier, uh, you can handle that. Notable features of Dimos, um, uh, as far as uh, compared to other trajectory optimization tools that I'm aware of, are vectorized states, controls, and parameters. With Otis, everything was rigorously uh, constrained uh, to be a scalar quantity at each point in time which made things like matrix vector, uh, matrix vector products uh, difficult to do. Um, access to the first and second time derivatives of control. So if I do uh, specify a control profile because of the, the pseudo spectral nature of the code and because I, I essentially represent uh, controls as uh, polynomials uh, throughout the phase through a vel relatively simple uh, matrix vector product, I can get access to the first and second time derivatives of those controls. And then we also allow our output to be available on arbitrary grids. Um, the most recent case in which this was useful to us as, as a design team uh, was for our electric tilt, tilt rotor design. Uh, we had the flight dynamics, which had a relatively you know, benign, uh, uh, slow, slow dynamics. And then we also had a thermal system with very little mass that responded very much in a, in a step function kind of fashion. So as the, the, the vehicle was flying, um, we essentially would lose the accuracy of those step-like responses of the thermal system. In order to accommodate that, one of the things you can do is you can increase the density, the number of polynomials that you're using to represent your states and controls in a phase. But if you increase the number of polynomials in the states uh, representing those states and controls, the cost of computation uh, goes up. In the case of the analysis we were doing, it went up quite a bit. What was easier for us to do was to say, we're going to have one phase that represents the flight dynamics of the vehicle. In this other phase, we're going to represent the response of the thermal system in the vehicle. Those two phases were essentially constrained to operate simultaneously in time. So that the beginning time of one phase and the final time of that phase had to be the same as uh, they were in the other. It's just that second phase doing the thermal analysis was allowed to be defined on a much denser grid. We could get the accuracy of it that we needed. and. Uh, and everything works a whole lot better. So the goals that we're going to do uh, of what we're going to do today are to set up an optimal control problem with Dimos, uh, and then we're going to uh, I'm going to try to help you guys learn what to do when things don't go well. Unfortunately, one of the things that we were talking about earlier is that uh, we need people to kind of think with their open MDAO hat when they do open MDAO analysis, thinking in terms of you know. Uh, what Otis, the Otis method and, and what now is in Dimos is another layer of thinking of another couple of wrinkles you need in your brain as far as what to do, how do I attack this problem and, and thinking of solving it in terms of the, of the capabilities available to you uh, with something like Dimos. Uh, so um, Eric Hendricks actually sent me uh, this problem a few weeks ago and it was an interesting optimal control problem. It was from uh, 538. Uh, 538's website. And uh, the text of the problem is that an enemy submarine is, is, uh, lies between your ship and your home port. And all that's known about that is that it's halfway, it's at the halfway mark between your current location and your port. And that sub has some speed. Uh, uh, and we want to know how much faster does my ship have to be than the sub to guarantee that that sub can't reach me. So. This is the problem uh, that the example cases that I'm going to run through uh, uh, tackles. So first, uh, the first thing you need to do with Dimos is figure out what your ODE is. It can be an ODE um, 
It can be algebraic differential equations if, if you want to use solvers internally. I call everything an ODE. Um, so that's what we're going to do here. Um, I have, I'm going to have two state variables, x and y, which are the, the horizontal, essentially uh, another uh, name for longitude and latitude, respectively. So uh, the, the uh, rate of change of our horizontal, or the rate of change of our east-west position, x, is uh, the velocity of the vehicle, or the velocity of our ship, uh, times the sine of some uh, steering angle, or the, uh, which is essentially the azimuth. And then uh, the y uh, speed is essentially the velocity times the cosine of that term. <clears throat> then uh, we need to consider the submarine. We're going to give the sub a speed of 1, unitless, because um, all we want to know is relative to that submarine, how fast do we need to be. So we'll say the speed of the sub, sub is 1. Whatever speed we figure out for our vehicle, we'll essentially you know, just divide by 1, and then we'll know how fast we need to be. Um, the other key assumption that we're making for this is that they didn't give a whole lot of, of detail about how the sub can steer. Um, solving cat and mouse uh, missile or interceptor and target uh, you know, uh, scenarios with optimal control where both things are supposedly intelligent and steering is extremely uh, difficult to do. You kind of have a race condition where you know, that's just an extremely difficult problem to, to optimize. Uh, so what we're going to do is just say, okay, um, we don't know where this sub is. That's the point. It submerbs, submerges, and then uh, its, its position is unknown to us. All we know is that it has some velocity that it can potentially attain. Therefore, there is a radius that grows with time around its initial starting point. Um, and we don't want to be any closer to its starting point <clears throat> uh, than the sub is at any given time. If, we, if otherwise, we're poten potentially within uh, range of it sinking, sinking us. I think I forgot to mention that detail of the way the, the problem is defined. The sub effectively has to be right under your ship in order to sink you. <clears throat> uh, in order to satisfy that constraint, uh, we're going to use a path constraint, which is a feature of Dimos um, and a lot of other uh, trajectory optimization tools. Uh, in order to avoid the sub, our ship must be greater than our, uh, our sub uh, units away from its origin at any given time. So if we compute the radius of our ship from, uh, from the sub's origin, assuming in this case that the sub starts at, at uh, x equals 0, y equals 0, uh, then our constraint equation is uh, the radius of the ship minus the radius of the sub has to be uh, greater, greater than or equal to 0. Technically greater than, but we're kind of finding the edge case here. The next thing I usually do when I'm coming up with uh, solving a problem in Dimos is I write out the XDSM uh, of the ODE system. So here we talked about three calculations uh, we need to make. <clears throat> Those are the equations of motion, X dot and Y dot. Uh, some navigation that essentially gives us the radius of our ship uh, uh, from the sub's origin. And then a, a threat component that compares our radius uh, to uh, the radius of the sub, which is effectively just time, takes the difference of those, and that's this range variable, range to sub, uh, that we need to avoid. Um, I think I will, s well, I'll leave this uh, in this mode right now before I switch out to my IDE. So this is uh, the class definition of um, the ODE for my optimal control problem. This class is just an open MDAO group. Uh, the ODE could also be just a component. If, if it were simple enough, I probably could have done all these computations in one component. Um, but conceptually, sometimes it's easier for me to explain things through an XDSM, so I separated them out. So uh, we have our equations of motion component, um, which is defined in another file, our navigation component, and our threat component. Our threat component, in this case, is just an OpenMDAO exec comp. An exec comp uh, does nothing other than uh, uh, parse, parse a string equation uh, instead of having us define a compute method. Uh, so our exec comp is going to compute the subrange, which is uh, the radius of a ship minus, uh, minus time, um, because time is also, as we said before, the radius of the sub. Um, uh, I know John, in, in his uh, talk before, kind of defined all these things with num nodes. Num nodes is important. To, that's essentially a, a dimosism. Dimos needs to be able to compute uh, my ODE at a many points simultaneously. How many uh, points it's computing it at is somewhat unknown. Um, 
it's, it's a function of what we call the co-location grid. I'll get into that in a bit. Um, all I know is that I want Dymos to be able to instantiate my ODE with some given number of nodes, and then I'm going to take that many, uh, uh, in, in essentially an input for each state at each node in time, and then an, an compute an output uh, for each uh, uh, output variable at each node in time. <clears throat> and then um, to finish off uh, the ODE, I'm not using promotes here, so I'm going to explicitly connect uh, the navigations comp uh, our ship to uh, the one that th uh, the threat comp needs. What you don't see here are connections of time or the states going into these, and we're going to handle those uh, momentarily, and I'll show them to you then. Uh, so just, this is me talking through things and being nervous and talking about things before I have slides that point to them. <laughs> so um, essentially the summary of our problem is we're, we have a single phase. Uh, we have one ODE. There are no intermediate boundary constraints. We have uh, two state variables, x and y. We have one design parameter, v. Uh, our ship's going to be moving constantly at, at that given velocity. We have one dynamic control, or azimuth angle, or phi. And our objective is to minimize the value of v uh, such, that, um, <clears throat> such that we safely make it back to port. We want to know how slowly can we possibly build our ship to be and still survive this. Um, next, we're going to uh, move on. Uh, to setting up the problem. So this is essentially the run script that I would use uh, to invoke this problem in OpenMDAO. <clears throat> um, so we import OpenMDAO API as OM. I kind of have commandeered DM for Dymos. Uh, uh, so we instantiate a problem. We say our problem is just an empty group. To that problem, I'm going to add a trajectory, which is just um, dm.trajectory. Technically, this is a single phase problem. Um, we don't have any phases to link together, which is mostly what trajectories help you to do. Um, so technically here, a trajectory is unnecessary. I think it's good practice to put them in, um, especially for documentation. I want to get users uh, used to the notion of having a problem containing a trajectory and then one or more phases in that trajectory. And then I create a phase. Uh, so this phase is just a portion of this trajectory. In this case, it's the entirety of the trajectory. Um, that phase marries together two concepts. It takes the ODE class, which I showed you in the last slide, which are Donner sub ODE, and it takes a transcription. And a transcription is effectively uh, the optimal control technique that we're going to use to take a, uh, the optimal control problem in which you're technically trying to find a function in time, and we're going to convert it to uh, a discrete nonlinear programming uh, problem that something like SNOPT or SLSQP can solve. Um, and then after that, we add the phase to our trajectory, we add the trajectory uh, to our model, uh, and we're good. I'm, uh, very shortly here, I'm going to switch out to the IDE and kind of go into more detail on that. Um, <clears throat> so what is transcription anyway? Like I said, a transcription uh, can converts a continuous optimal control problem into a discrete NLP problem. Uh, the key feature uh, that you should probably be aware of for today is that uh, it contains something called a, a grid or a mesh. Um, as our colleague Jeff Chin said, co-location techniques are really just finite element uh, methods uh, that are in time instead of in space. Um, so basically, we have a certain number of points spread throughout the trajectory time history and we're trying to find uh, the values of, of the position, of, essentially the position of the vehicle and the controls of the vehicle at all the points uh, throughout that trajectory. Um, I can make a grid, in this case with pseudo spectral methods, uh, the grid essentially controls how many polynomial segments I'm using to represent each state or each control. Um, I can have a lot of high order, or ask, sorry, I can have um, very few uh, high order segments, so just a few segments of like 21st polynomial order. Um, uh, or I can have a lot of uh, uh, very low order segments, like 23rd order segments. I tend to err on the side of having a lot of low order segments. Uh, you get better sparsity uh, that I'll sh show later. And um, we also are just now working on a grid refinement algorithm that will look through there and say, well, okay, you can start with that. And if that doesn't work out, we'll start increasing the order of your polynomials or adding more segments in as necessary in order to fix the accuracy of your uh, co-location grid. 
So <clears throat> the two methods I talked about a little bit about earlier were the high order uh, Legendre gauss lobato transcription by uh, Herman and Conway. This is a generalization of a, an older technique, uh, the Herman Hermit Simpson technique, which was I think pioneered by Diekmans and Wells in 19, uh, the 1970s. And then later Steve Paris and Charles Hargraves at Boeing used that as a sense um, and expanded on that as the basis for Otis. Diekmans and Wells solved optimal control problems the old way. They, they turned everything into two point boundary value problems with, with co-states uh, that were, you know, if you haven't, if you don't do optimal control, you probably don't know what a co-state is. Um, and you're better off for it. Uh, um, Paris and Hargraves applied that technique and said, hey, look, we don't even need to, to bother with these co-states. It still works great. Um, admittedly, the techniques used in Otis are a little less rigorous. Um, some of that rigor has since been put back in uh, to these pseudospectral techniques um, by uh, Anil Rao uh, and um, uh, Mike Ross uh, and a bunch of others. Um, so this is the initial guess of a state variable. I think technically this is the flight path angle in my minimum time to climb example. So this is, um, I'm guessing that my flight path angle, and this is uh, Legendre uh, gauss lobato transcription. This is, I believe, 10, uh, <clears throat> 10 polynomial segments. They are spaced, e I don't know. Hold on. There we go. Uh, 10 polynomial segments spaced equally in time. They are third order. A third order polynomial segment needs four pieces of information uh, to, to, give me a, uh, to give me a proper third order polynomial. So for each segment, um, we have what we call the discretization nodes here, which are the circles, and we have uh, the collocation nodes, which are uh, the triangles. <clears throat> so I've guessed the values of my state at my discretization nodes. I evaluate the values, I evaluate my ODE at those state discretization nodes. And now that I have values and rates there, because that's what the ODE gives me is the, is the rate. With the values and rates there, I have my, two, my four pieces of information. I can now form an interpolating polynomial, which are in these uh, light gray. That interpolating polynomial, uh, then we reevaluate it. Um, in the case of a third order polynomial, uh, the, we evaluate it at the midpoint. Um, and then now we have two estimates for the slope of that polynomial. We have an estimate that comes from uh, in the slope of the interpolating polynomial, and we can reevaluate the ODE at these midpoints and get uh, es estimates uh, from for the uh, rate of the state variable based on evaluating the ODE. We have these two competing uh, pieces of information, and effectively we're going to drive uh, what these are what we call the differential defects or just the defects. We're going to drive those to zero. When we drive those to zero, in theory, as long as we have enough points, then our polynomial time history here will match physics. If we don't have enough points, that's a different <laughs> different story. Um, and then once we're feasible and we're matching physics, then uh, typically we hit that point first, and then the optimizer will continue to drive these. Uh, until not only are they feasible, but they're also optimally satisfying our uh, optimal control problem. So this is, uh, in this case, what SNOP's uh, doing. It's torquing the values at the circles, the values of our flight path angle, uh, at the, the discretization nodes, until the disagreement between the blue and the red arrows goes away. Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, based on that that problem, is it you were talking about multiples, the ability to handle multiples? Can can uh, could you have uh, that problem solved if you had multiple modes with uh, multiple constraints or capabilities, uh, trying to approach the same uh, harbor, and then? I would think I would think in that case one of them would be the limiting case, but in theory, yes, you can do that. Because like. It, it, like one ship protects the other ship that protects a different ship and they have different constraints. Well, in, in, the, in, the very, in the very basic formulation of this problem, one ship, if you, if you have multiple ships, then one ship is potentially closest to the sub. That ship is going to be in danger first. So that ship needs to be the fastest. So if, there's, if the speed of your ship is determined, it is essentially determined by the limiting case, then in that case, that would be the one that mattered. In that but, case, so the, the protector ship and the other ship, they just change places and then it's like a chess game? Uh, this, the math here is much more, um, we're 
this is much more of a toy problem. You're right. Like if if the sub was intelligent, then it would pick a target to chase. All we know here is that the sub has a given speed, and and it's essentially its position where it possibly could be that we don't know, but its position where it's possibly be could be is just growing out as a circle. And all we're basically trying to do is get back to our port while avoid the, avoiding that circle as we go. Can I just change the question slightly to make it relevant to uh, to aerospace and wind turbines? Uh huh. Um, is it possible to use the same technique to optimize the uh, uh, density or localization of a wind farm based on the parameters that you? I think there are other people here. <laughs> um, unfortunately, that's not been my expertise. I don't know how much of a dynamic problem that is compared to just, um, you know, let's assume a, a constant wind. If you're assuming a constant wind, and a con then you just place your and Please correct me if I'm wrong, because because I'm I'm approximating here. But I but I but I think that's generally not as dynamic a problem. Although you could treat it as one if you wanted the, the wind profile to change speed and things like that. Um, but uh, so I guess the long answer is yes, but the short answer is you probably wouldn't start uh, with that kind of analysis. So I'll ask you the other part afterwards. Okay. Okay. By there, where we're uh, really considering this is the application of floating offshore wind, where you have an extremely dynamic environment. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, we're looking at where the potential is for that. Okay. All right. Um, the other of the pseudo spectral methods that we support is the Radal pseudo spectral method. Um, which most of the literature on this is by Rao, Peterson, Garg, and, and others uh, from the University of Florida. Um, this method uh, is similar to gauss lobato They both are using these, these special nodes uh, that essentially minimize our, our integration error. Um, they use uh, the Radal nodes. Um, their method uh, has more variables in it than the equivalent accuracy gauss lobato problem but their method also doesn't require that intermediate interpolation step. So um, if you notice up here on my uh, initial interpolation, I'm specifying a constant value of zero for all, for all values throughout time, but things are getting interpolated and I'm ending up with some non-zero non values of, um, of my uh, flight path angle here. Um, if I had, for instance, a solver in my ODE that was reliant on getting reasonable values in order to converge, this interpolation step with a bad guess could throw me off and I would essentially you know, have a hard time getting my solver inside the ODE to converge. That's where, um, in our experience, the Radal method has really shined, is that even though you have this larger problem, uh, I can directly control, uh, essentially through bounds parameters, the maximum allowable and minimum allowable bound uh, of my of my state variables, and it provides fewer surprises uh, to any um, iterative systems inside my ODE. <clears throat> so this one's much more dense, but this is essentially um, showing showing the same thing. The difference uh, in our interpolation nodes, or sorry, the difference between uh, the the values of our uh, derivatives of our states between the slopes of our interpolating polynomial, which are zero in this case, because everything's just going horizontally, and, uh, and our computed values coming out of the ODE. So if we integrate that. I believe this is still 10 polynomials. The Radal nodes are not equally spaced. Um, the, it's somewhat misleading when you show gauss lobato with third order because there's only a left endpoint, a right endpoint, and a midpoint. Uh, as you get to higher order uh, lobato nodes, they tend to group themselves at the edges of the polynomial. With uh, Radal nodes, they tend to, the nodes tend to bunch themselves at the end of each polynomial. So you'll see, um, like on the left side, there's node, node, and then two nodes bunched up. So that defines the, the first polynomial. Radao is not using the rate information to do the interpolation, unlike the Lobato method. So our four pieces of information are coming from the values of those four nodes. That's why there's more variables here, because for a third order polynomial, I need uh, four state values. <clears throat> 
Oh, next slide, please. Oh, just a minute. <laughs> Having a little trouble getting to my next slide. Yep. <laughs> I do know why, because that was the last slide. There you go. Derp. All right. So now I'm going to switch to my IDE. Let me blow things up here and make things easier to see for you all. Can you all read that? It can, good, okay. So this is the problem I was talking about <clears throat> where uh, we define our trajectory, we instantiate our phase, we add that phase to, our, to the trajectory and then add that trajectory to our model. Um, the next step is uh, configuring the phase. So we need uh, to worry about a few things. We need to worry about how our phase considers time, uh, the states involved in our phase, the design parameters or controls and any constraints. Um, and if our phase has uh, essentially, or if our phase has an objective function, then the objective function of our phase. So here we're setting uh, the time options or telling it that our uh, time is unitless. <coughs> um, our talk, uh, the time inside of our ODE needs to get connected to the path uh, threatcomp.time. Uh, so regardless of where our phase and the transcription method uses, when it instantiates our ODE, it knows to connect our time variable uh, to that value. Um, oh, our initial time is fixed, so uh, we just say that here. Um, so whatever value I specify as the initial time of my problem will not be a design parameter for the optimization. And then uh, the duration bounds are between uh, 0.1 seconds and or 0.1 time units, since it's unitless, and 100 time units. Uh, next are our states. So I come here and I say, OK, I'm going to add a state variable named x. The rate source of x within the ODE is given by eomcomp.dxdt. If I go up to. Here's the ODE I showed earlier. If I then go no, that's not gonna work. <clears throat> uh, this is my EOM comp definition. So I have four in, uh, two inputs, velocity and heading angle, or azimuth angle, and two outputs, essentially east-west velocity and north-south velocity. Um, not only do I need to give it uh, the rate source of my states, some parameters in my ODE, and this is not universally true for all problems, but some parameters in my ODE are functions of X and some are functions of Y, namely my navigation, um, my, my radius of my ship from the, the center of the sub or sub starting position. Uh, so I need to specify the targets here. And then I know where my ship is starting uh, at, the, at the initial time. So I'm going to say that its initial uh, X and Y positions are fixed. And I know where I want to go. I know where my harbor is. So uh, the final uh, X and Y positions are fixed. When I was showing you those polynomials that were evolving earlier, when I fix those, what that effectively means is that this node and this node are not design variables. They can't move. I have to change the other, th other nodes, uh, the other values of my X and Y throughout time in order to comply with physics, but these last two values are not allowed uh, to change. The other alternative that we could have done is to say, OK, I'm going to let them be free, but I'm going to use uh, an, a constraint on an output. Uh, effectively, I'm going to tell OpenMDAO after the fact, it's like, when this is all said and done, you have to end up at my boundary constraint locations, where my harbor is on the, on the far end and where I start on the initial end. 
Um, it's similar to uh, in today's first talk, Anil was talking about how the optimizer sometimes likes to violate the feasible space uh, in order to get a better solution. Um, with these pseudo spectral methods, one of the advantages of them is that it's not a real trajectory at every iteration. It's kind of just guessing, you know, what if I lay these points out like this? What if I lay these points out like this? It might find that, oh, if I, if I play in this part of the space up here, I get something good, but it's really hard to figure out how to get there from here. And if I have a shooting method where I'm con con constrained to at each iteration, uh, have a physical trajectory, it might be difficult for me to like jump some kind of barrier uh, that might be in the, in the space in between. By having these implicit methods, it can start to play up there and say, oh, I really want to figure out a way to make this happen, and it'll work on that. It's kind of similar to the uh, way Anil's code was kind of finding these intermediate uh, uh, invalid, essentially uh, infeasible solutions, and then working back to the best possible case from there. <clears throat> um, I add my design parameter, uh, which is I'm calling V, um, and then that gets uh, connected in the, in the uh, ODE to eomconf.v. I'm telling it that I want it to be optimal. Uh, really what adding a design parameter is doing under the hood in this phase, it's creating an in-depth var comp uh, that owns this variable. So by adding a design parameter here, effectively I'm saying this, this uh, phase owns that variable. If I want it to be optimized, I just say true, and it'll automatically add it as also as a design parameter with any uh, upper and lower bounds that I specify. Also, if I have scaling, either through scalar and adder or ref zero and ref, I can uh, impose those here. Um, I didn't talk about scaling. You can also apply scaling to both the states and the de state defects. I can get into that a little bit later. Um, my dynamic control variable is, uh, is phi. Uh, the, here's its target in the ODE, and its units are in radians uh, by default. Um, and then I have this path constraint that I need to satisfy. I want uh, the subrange to never go below zero. I'm thinking personally, if I was on the ship, I would never want it to go below 100, but I'm just going to go with this for now because that's kind of the way the solution of the problem online is posed. Um, and then I added an objective to my phase. Since my phase knows that V is one of my uh, optimal control variables, it's a design parameter, it looks through here and says, oh, I, I know what your objective is. I know, I know where to find that in the system. Um, so if your objective is a DIMOS uh, state, uh, control, design parameter, uh, or time, you can use one of those here, and it will just automatically know and find it. So we do do a little bit of magic on, on, on top of OpenMDAO uh, to help you out. The next thing I'm going to do is set up a driver. My preference, uh, especially with a lot of these problems, SLSQP can handle basic optimal control problems, but it breaks as they get um, uh, more and more complex, and it doesn't take a whole lot of complexity to start to break SLSQP. Um, so I use SNOPT. Um, uh, I think we're also working on getting IPOP to work. I haven't used it much. I've used it on one project in the past. I have not used it through PyOps sparse driver. Um, but I would love for us to be able to do that just because it's this essentially a, a free optimizer with capabilities akin to those of SNOPT, namely that it understands sparsity. Let's see. Uh, I'm adding a recorder. This recorder is going to record my solution uh, to the SQL file. Uh, I'm also going to include this uh, thing time series. I'm going to talk about time series in a little bit, but. Um, because of the different transcription methods, if I compute, uh, if I have some output of my ODE that I'm interested in, like subrange, um, if I'm in a gauss lobato technique, I have two copies uh, in that phase of my ODE. I have the ODE that's computing the values at my state discretization nodes, and I have the ODE that's computing values at my colocation nodes. If I want to know what all the values uh, of subrange are, I essentially have them in two separate places. They need to be interleaved because you know the, the, the ordering the, uh, those those nodes in the case of third order polynomials alternate. That's not very convenient. Uh, in the Radal method, there's a single ODE. I can get those things everywhere. But rather than um, rather than have the user in their post-processing code say, oh, I know where the path is to this, so I want to change transcription, now I have to change paths. This time series object gathers in, sequ in, in time sequence all the values of, of uh, whatever variables you're interested in and um, uh, reports those back to you. 
So those are a really good thing to record in your, uh, in your uh, case recorder. And then we're also going to record anything that's an objective, a constraint, or design variable. I set up the problem. <clears throat> After I set up the problem, I can specify initial values. So t initial is the name of our initial uh, value in time. So remember, I have a certain number of nodes. They are essentially fixed in non-dimensional uh, time. I'm saying that initial time is 0. I'm guessing that my initial the duration of this phase is 1. Um, and then as Dimos is solving, since uh, the duration of the phase is not constrained, it's going to stretch those out. The location of all the nodes in, inside there are, are going to move essentially in a, in a fine transform and figure out, uh, you know, as I figure out what the correct uh, final duration of the phase should be. <clears throat> um, then I set values of my states. When I'm setting values of my states, this is an implicit method. I have to specify every value of the state uh, uh, at every node. It's hard to know, especially if you're switching uh, uh, transcriptions, where in time your nodes follow uh, or where they fall. Uh, so we have this phase interpolate method that um, by default will do a linear interpolation. So by default, I'm saying, okay, my initial y value is zero, my final y value is zero. I want you to interpolate at the state input nodes um, uh, remember, uh, which essentially the state input nodes are uh, a subset of the state discretization nodes, and that's a detail I'm not going to bore you with right now. But uh, I'm only going to interpolate at, at, at those specific nodes, <clears throat> and uh, this interpolate function will figure out what they need to be for me. Since it's essentially just a constant, I could have easily have just said, you know, value equals zero and done the same thing here. But I'm trying to let you understand what the difference is. On x, it's a little different. Um, I am moving essentially from a position of negative one, zero to one, zero is, uh, is my uh, optimization problem here. Because remember, I'm fixing these initial values and final values. So now uh, x is going to be interpolated uh, from negative one to one at whatever, uh, wherever the nodes uh, fall in, uh, um, in um, my non-dimensional time space. I do the same thing for phi. Uh, so we're going to interpolate. I'm going to say that this is from 90 to 90, and I'm going to override the units and say, uh, regardless of how it, I defined it as radians earlier, you should optimize it as if it's in radians. But when I give you the inputs, I'm going to specify things in degrees. It will do the conversion for you. It will give things back out at the control input nodes and assign those uh, control values. Uh, and then lastly, design parameter. Since a design parameter is just a scalar, I can just give that and say, OK, I'm going to guess that I need a velocity of 2. I don't know if that's the case. Um, if we run this problem, sit here, and this is about the time you start cursing, because you don't know what's wrong. You say, I don't know what happened. But that's why we're here. So here's uh, PyOp Sparse automatically outputs all of my uh, uh, constraints. Here are all my constraints, including uh, state defects, defects in continuity, defects in co-location. I didn't mention, but when you have two adjacent polynomials, there's an option as to whether do I include that intermediate point where they connect? Is that a single design value or design a variable? Or do I let them be separate and have two separate design variables there and then constrain them uh, through constraint uh, to have to equal one another? Um, here, I'm saying they're separated. So one of the constraints uh, that Dimos is satisfying is uh, forcing that continuity to be driven to 0. If we scroll up. And look at what SNOP did. It said, hey, I had numerical difficulties. <clears throat> um, so as for what's going wrong here, um, does anyone have an idea of, there's actually two things wrong, but if does anyone have an idea of what we could potentially be doing wrong here? All right. So what's going on is our initial guess, uh, the sub started at the origin. We started at negative 1, 0, and went, are going to 1, 0. Um, we're going right over the origin. Our radius function is a square root. Uh, and if you look at that square root function, uh, like in the 3D plane, it's a cone. It's, it looks like an absolute value. So the first thing that we can probably change is to say, hey, let's not um, 
pose this submarine range as uh, the square root as our ship minus time. In set, instead, what we're going to do is compute subrange. With the, this is technically going to be uh, no longer actually our range, but we're going to say that the radius of the ship squared minus the time squared, that has to be equal to zero. Now, instead of having uh, a square root function, essentially absolute value like behavior at the origin, we have a paraboloid at the origin. Uh, so our, uh, and if we sail over the origin, our derivatives don't blow up. So if we run that, oh, sorry, just a second here. Uh, just a minute. Yeah, that's I didn't include. Basically, what I want to do is copy this over this. And technically, when I did that, I've So this, uh, I didn't want to fix both errors at once. So this is the first error that I come across. I'm sailing straight over, and Dimos is telling me, I think this problem is infeasible. And uh, this can be frustrating to see. In this case, it's a really kind of a tricky situation. Um, we're, flying, we're, we're sailing directly over this origin. And in order to make this easier to explain, I'm going to let you guys see the answer ahead of time. But this is the sort of behavior of the answer that we should expect. We, we sail until we're essentially tangent with the sub's possible position, and then we're riding that radius so, so that we're riding that uh, path constraint until we get back to port. Uh, my initial guess uh, takes us right over the origin. And although we fixed the behavior of the constraint at that origin, now SNOPT is con confused because it doesn't know which way to go. If I turn left and start essentially a southerly track, that gets me around it. But if I turn right, that also satisfies the constraint in the same possible way. Um, so SNOP doesn't know if we should turn left or right, or right in 3 quarters, or maybe not quite, because when you're a parent, everything is a Dr. Seuss rhyme. And <laughs> so, so we, have to, we have to provide a, a better initial guess here. There are optimal control tools out there. Um, Dido uh, makes a name for itself saying that they don't need an initial guess. Uh, we are not that yet. So we need to provide. <coughs> a good initial guess here, at least a somewhat more reasonable initial guess. So if I, go back to my training, the solution that I took was just to say, okay, I'm going to say that my heading angle, and I'm, Justin says I'm solving this problem wrong because I decided to solve it sailing east, um, but, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to say that I'm starting with an azimuth of 80 degrees and then ending with an azimuth of 100 degrees, whereas before these were both 90. So now instead of having a control profile that suggests I sail due east, now I have a control profile that says I'm going to start by heading uh, northeast and then end by heading southeast and still get to the same place that I wanted to get to. Um, um, yeah, so if we run this. Now things you see that, and then you get the little endorphin rush because, it, <laughs> because things worked right. And the day gets every, the sun's a little brighter, um, so everything worked there. Um, going back to uh, where they talk about this problem, so this is the solution they came up with, and according to them, when they defined that, their answer was two point three three. 
and our objective value is 2.33. So yay. Was one of the parameters or conditions that the sub could only terminate the ship when the sub was directly under yep. the ship? Yeah, so it's, it's effectively a manned depth charge, right? So <laughs> it's intuitively, I would go right at the sub because if you're faster than the sub, because that puts you closer to the harbor and you can avoid if you have to at that point. That's what I would intuitively. But the notion of this, and, and it's a it's a it's a tricky problem set up because if once you get into uh, vehicle threat analysis and actually trying to outfly your opponent and you're so you're optimally trying to outfly your opponent, your opponent's trying to optimally uh, kill you. Does that make that, sense? Though, yeah. That if you're faster than the sub, that you go the subs between you and the end result point. But, go right at but in our case, we don't know what the sub is doing at any given point. Oh, so you don't know the location at that time? It's, all you know is that it's submerged at the halfway point. It's, it's halfway oh, down okay. through, and it could be anywhere. So oh, as soon as it gets... So, it so north or south. Yep, it could have gone anywhere. So all we know is that, you know, this is where the sub submerged. Um, let's not be where it possibly can be. It's basically... The, uh, that's, that's the tack taken... Um, so that worked all right, and it was reasonably fast. Um, I don't think it was fast enough, and I think we can do better. Um, so we're going to next, we're, we're going to turn on OpenMDO's uh, automatic coloring, dynamic coloring, and we're going to see if we perform any better. So that's all we need to do here. And that's still pretty slow. If I go and look at the coloring solution, it really didn't buy me much at all. So let's take a look at what's going on here. So if I do open, uh, coloring, So I have parts of my equations that are sparse, but then I have this giant dense chunk right here. That is coming from the exec comp uh, that computes my path constraint. How do I know that? Well, I know it because when uh, PyOps sparse outputted all my constraints to me, the path constraints were the last constraints. So since it's the bottom of my Jacobian that's exhibiting the density, I know that's the problem. Uh, fortunately, um, exec comps now allow us, uh, they, they do uh, CS partials. Uh, that's the way exec comps work. They do complex step. They also support, um, uh, they also support sparsity and to, um, to take advantage of that sparsity. I need to add an another option to my exec comp. And that uh, component is, is has dag partials equals true. And also, uh, to make Justin happy, one of the things I did here was that um, I declared, when I originally wrote this ship component, I'm just in such a habit of doing my own uh, analytic partials that I did my partials myself. Justin said, hey, let's show off the, the um, declare coloring for partials. So sure, let's do that. So I'm going to do that and then show the sparsity pattern when I run this. So while he gets that running, I just want to 
give a slightly more detailed explanation on what he did with the exec comp. So that exec comp is literally just evaluating that expression, and it's dense because you didn't tell. It doesn't know anything about the Jacobian. And it's not using the coloring or anything. It's just it's kind of just naively assuming that every output depends on every input. But if you've written, if you know that you've written a vectorized exec comp, in other words, like you know, it's a vector in and a vector out, and each entry in that vector only affects the equivalent output, then the Jacobian is diagonal, right? And so if the Jacobian is diagonal, then that's what has diag partials mean. So it, it can't support like arbitrary sparsity if you have some weird NumPy methods that are creating relationships between sub different entries. Huh? Subjacobians. Yeah. The subjacobians are, di are diagonal, right? Sorry. The the sub hit us, the, the depth charge hit us. <laughs> it does sound like an Atari game, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so that for exec comp specifically, when you have diagonal subjacobians, when all of your subjacobians are diagonal, you can use that option. So if we run that, let's see here. Uh, this was six seconds before. We're down to three. Uh, this is the coloring as it sees it. I don't. Why isn't this? Do you know why that's not a single diagonal for that component? Or is that? Oh, is it showing the two, the two variables? OK. So uh, the question on the sparsity then, isn't it always true in these path constraints that they're going to be diagonal? So why is it an option not just always on? I mean, unless you're, you're saying. The well, so I, I'm just thinking from the output control perspective, right? The, that path constraint, any path constraint. What if my path constraint. constraints of matrix vector product, and then it's, then it's not quite a diagonal, right? So it depends on the shape of the variable that you're path constraining. I, I could, in theory, path constrain well, so it. So it would be, wouldn't be, yeah, be blocks of that. Yeah. Right? So, so, so I know a lot of people, they, they know a priori that sparsity. So you can get more sparse by knowing that there's a, there is a Z, but Z doesn't show up. Yeah. But, but generally you always know that there's always block diagonals. Yeah. So are you embedding any of that sparsity in query or are you, are you using it's, the tools that do it for you? We're using the tools that do, do it okay. for us. Um, yeah, like o Otis worked that way. Otis was finite difference, but it assumed, it, it didn't know your dynamics. It didn't know your, your partials. So it just had to assume, okay, I'm just going to naively assume that any constraint in the first segment is potentially impacted by the design variables in the first segment, then you get this block diagonal structure, and then times and design parameters are dense columns. Um, here, um, we're just uh, leveraging the OpenMDAO capability. So if you define that component to have sparse partials, it'll be really fast. If you don't, it's on you. Um, I hadn't thought about automating. I don't see you, I don't know if I can generalize that. Are you asking that. specifically about has diag partials on the exec comp? Well, just in, in, when you said it was fully dense, it was like, I, I know without even knowing what the, the form of the constraint is, yeah. that it's going to be that form. Oh, yep. so, so in general, I see. you make some assumptions on parts of the problem. In, in this case. That's, so, so that's true for pure optimal control yes, problems. Yeah. However, Dimos was designed specifically to do mix, mixtures of optimal control. And so we do not assume, we intentionally don't assume anything about the Jacobian structure, because when you add something before or after Dimos, you'll break those assumptions. Yeah. So instead, we rely on the generalized coloring to find the sparsity pattern. The next thing I want to do is um, we, have, we have output, and we don't know um, if it's accurate or not. One of the ways, and again, running back to Otis, this is the, the Otis way of initially knowing whether or not your solution is accurate, is just to take your ODE, you throw it into SciPy ODE int or whatever your preferred integrator is, you take your control profile history, you interpolate that at any given point in time as you step through, and you say, if I explicitly do that integration, how does that compare to the polynomial fit? Um, we support that um, through uh, simulation. And uh, we have methods, a method called simulate that exists on both a phase and on the entire trajectory. So if you just want to sim run simulate on a single phase, it will take the ODE out of that phase. It will essentially wrap it so that uh, scipy ODE int, or now scipy.solve IVP, 
uh, can can access it. It will uh, execute it as many times as solve IP, IVP needs and, and propagate out your solution. And then we're going to have that saved in this uh, Donner sub simulation SQL, uh, SQL database. Um, what's actually happening in here is a little bit kludgy, but we're uh, making a new problem uh, that, that contains a trajectory with any phase you want to simulate. And then that phase's transcription is what we call the solve IVP transcription. Uh, that solve IP VP transcription is what's calling SciPy ODE int or SciPy solve IVP for every segment of the problem. So if you allow a lot of segments, it can take a little bit of time. We also don't do any uh, gradients with it. So you, we have that in there so that we have this uniform interface and we can do things like recording without having to invent our own, but you cannot do optimization uh, with that mode of the solve IVP problem. So if I run this, And I just also want to point out that this one is back to using the analytic derivatives on my um, on my EOM comp. And now instead of being at three seconds and getting a 50% speed up, I went down from six seconds originally down to one second. So I still like doing analytic derivatives. Um, so, so that performs. Um, the explicit simulation. Um, now I want to plot the results. Um, depending on what results I want to plot, I might need to add more outputs. By default, that time series output that I talked about will automatically include our time, all of our state variables, our control variables, our design parameters. Um, but in this case, I'm also interested in like sub range uh, or our ship. And so, um, I need to add those explicitly as time series outputs. My ODE system could be arbitrarily huge, and I don't necessarily want to include every output that it's computing in my logging. So this time series output object that essentially is, is aggregating my, my time series variables, um, I have to explicitly uh, give those variables to it. Um, at the moment, we have to also explicitly give those the shape of those variables to it, where it assumes that um, this is the shape at each given point in time. So these variables were defined in those files as number of nodes because they're number of nodes by one. Um, they're scalars in time. Um, I think now that we have some new features in OpenMDAO, I can get around this because this is the connectivity issue where now we're allowed to specify connections in the configure method. Anyway, um, I'm going to add these time series outputs. And because uh, um, because I included anything with the name time series in its path in my recording, I will record those. Um, and then I'm also going to run my simulation and uh, capture the simulation like that. So now I have this uh, two SQL files. One is uh, Donner sub solution. The other is Donner sub simulation. I'd like to plot those, you pull out your favorite plotting language. I like, I'm still stuck on that plot lid. And that works for me. So we instantiate a case readers uh, to get the final case from the solution file and the final case from the simulation file. The simulation file is only going to have one case in it. It only did, essentially we did a run model to get the, uh, the simulation out. But the solution case has every iteration along the way, uh, including the miners. Um, in order to get the final one, I just uh, ask for uh, uh, case negative one. Uh, among the things that I want to show are the speed that we found. And then I start pulling out variable values. So uh, my solution values for time, latitude, longitude, I should have called these x, I apologize, x and y. But uh, my solution values come from their paths in the problem, which are traj, that was the name of my trajectory path. Phase zero was the name of my phase. And then time series, uh, time series dot states colon state name, or time series dot time for the time variable. Or because we added a, a variable whose final part of its path was sub range, uh, time series dot sub range uh, to get the range of the sub. And then I do, the, I do the same inquiries into the database for the simulation outputs. And then I'm going to set up a few plots and show them. 
So if we right click that. So if you remember on the website, the, the sub was going, or the ship was traveling west or east to west. I'm going to be based on the west coast and go east to west. So this is my straight line path. And then um, at this point, I start to encounter the, the sub and I have to actively ride this path constraint. So the range to the sub never goes negative, although it gets really close. In fact, if we zoom in on this, because un underlying these dynamics, things are polynomials, you know, my discrete points say, hey, cool, I'm not violating my subrange. When I go to explicitly simulate out and explicitly take that control profile history and see where it goes, I do actually go negative here uh, for a brief amount of time. Um, I'm going to show you in a minute uh, our current progress on our um, grid refinement, which will essentially figure out where uh, errors are as far as the dynamics are concerned and makes things more dense. That actually fixes uh, this situation for us. It does not explicitly take into account path constraint violations yet, although I don't think that's a big change uh, to implement. Uh, let's see here. So now grid refinement is uh, the same exact problem that we had before. Now I've added, instead of calling uh, prob, uh, p dot uh, run driver, I'm going to call this dimos run problem method. And the run problem method, among other things uh, that we eventually intend for it to be able to do, uh, is going to be able to run grid refinement for us. Uh, for now, I'm just very basically turning that on with refine equals true. There are some settings at the phase level that you can use uh, to control how it works. Right now, those settings are just a Boolean refine that says, yes, this phase wants to be potentially refined. Uh, and then a tolerance, which is effectively the error in our state dynamics uh, that we consider to be acceptable. Under the hood, what this is going to do is run the problem, solve it, uh, then analyze the error. And then after analyzing the error, it gets a new idea for how many, uh, how many segments and the polynomial order of each of those segments in here that we should be using. Uh, so we're starting with 30. I'm going to start with 10. And we'll see how it goes from there. Um, after it determines the new grid, it applies those values to the new grid. It calls setup again. The setup stack goes through and essentially, you know, redeclares the sizes of our variables. We then take the previous solution that we still have access to, interpolate that solution onto this new variable set, and then resolve the problem. Um, and this is going to terminate either when it uh, reaches the maximum allowed number of iterations or uh, when it achieves the desired accuracy. So there's one, two, three, four, Um, if we look at grid refinement dot out, is Kashik here? Oh, there's Kashik. Kashik uh, works in my branch. She implemented this algorithm. I'm really a fan of it right now and pending some very minor cleanups. I think everyone's going to like it. Um, so this was our original grid where the segment ends. Uh, these were equally spaced segments. So our segment ends fell at these points kind of in, in non-dimensional time throughout the phase. Uh, these are the associated errors. Since some of those are above uh, 1e negative 6, um, it refined those. This is a uh, pH refinement method. Um, and it works by increasing. It prefers to increase the order of the polynomial. But if we would have specified never use a polynomial of order greater than 3, then it would have essentially resorted just to increasing the number of uh, segments available. So this is. Uh, what it works on. Essentially, it's, it's making the polynomial where we encounter the sub higher order. And then that's not accurate enough, so it does it some more. And then that's not accurate enough, so it starts breaking things and adding more segments and then adding more order to them. And at that point, essentially, everything's accurate enough and it's happy. 
Uh, and this is a problem that we have right now with our, one of the things I, I need to fix, but essentially the, the um, case reader is not correctly reading out um, the new uh, orientation or the, so the new number of nodes correctly. But if I just zoom in here on the explicit solution, then that uh, wavy behavior down here is much less pronounced. So essentially it removes some of the, the error from our solution for us. This is one of the ways in which I'm calling setup over again is one of the ways which I'm abusing the OpenMDAO API. So um, we're working on fixing that right now. Multiple phases. Um, so one of the situations you might find yourself in is I wanna know what the maximum Northern extent of my vehicle, of my ship during this trajectory was. Um, you could apply a path constraint and uh, apply like a max function to your, your Y history and say, what was the maximum value of Y that I achieved? Um, but that max function is not gonna be differentiable. And if you care about uh, gradient based optimization, that's not acceptable. One of the things we can do is we can constrain this phase, <clears throat> the first phase to essentially end when the ship essentially turns and starts headed south again back to port. There are a couple ways to do this. Um, the first way that I actually tried was just to implement this boundary constraint. Um, but in this problem, uh, there's really no inertia. So in order to satisfy that boundary constraint, all the thing has to do is make a very momentarily, very momentary blip to do east, dy dt goes to zero, and it says, hey, I satisfied your boundary constraint. Um, and then in the next phase, it's like, now I'm gonna continue doing what I was going to do anyway. Um, it has such a minor impact on the overall speed that it's really not picked up by the optimizer to see that sensitivity, at least with the scaling, default scaling that I used. And so it cheated to, to, uh, to find the answer, and it wasn't the answer that I wanted. So I had to start thinking, what's a better way to pose uh, um, this bound, pose a constraint so that my first eight phase naturally ends where the, where the ship turns back to coming south. Um, for instance, using uh, this rate variable um, in, in launch vehicle analysis, we're often concerned with what's the maximum dynamic pressure that I saw throughout the ascent. And dynamic pressure, your vehicle has a lot of uh, inertia associated with it, and you could more easily capture that, that, uh, that condition with a basic constraint like this. But since it didn't work in this case, and Dimos and OpenMDO were essentially trying to cheat in order to uh, satisfy what I wanted, I said, okay, I'm gonna find a different way. I left that one in place. Um, I probably could remove it. But I also said, okay, I'm gonna have a path constraint that says um, my first phase is never allowed to have uh, dy dt be negative. So I essentially always have to travel north uh, through this first phase. And then, uh, in the second phase, uh, dy dt always has to be uh, less than zero. So if I run this, um, so what I've done here, I should expand on, on this more. I've added two phases. My default nomenclature in my head is always phase zero, phase one, phase n. Um, but you can name these whatever you want. Um, and then the trajectory object, I, I say, I want to link two phases together. I want phase zero to be connected to phase one. I want them to be continuous in time, x, y, and phi. So I want to be, them to be continuous in time, uh, my control variable, and my state variables. Um, the velocity parameter, I don't want to be owned by a phase anymore. I don't want each phase to be separately deciding what its best speed is. I want one best speed throughout the entire trajectory and I want that to be fed uh, to my phases. So um, I can add a design parameter at the trajectory level. So traj add design parameter. I'm gonna add, add V and I'm saying, all right, in phase zero, I want that to be connected to this target. In phase one, I want it to be connected uh, to this target. Um, there are various rules for how these custom targets work because admittedly, if you have a complex system, this list of potential targets in each phase grows a lot. Um, there, you, there are a few options you can do. In, in your first phase, you can, you can manually add an input parameter to your, your first phase. An input parameter is essentially just a pass-through that says, I'm going to accept this variable from the outside world and I'm going to send it to whoever in my ODE needs it. Um, 
and that is effectively uh, uh, what tr trad parameters demand of, of each phase, and that's what is going on under the hood here. Um, if you want to escape this verbosity, you could have kind of declared those input parameters in each phase, and then just say, "Hey, um, I'm going to leave this out, and it's going to determine. Oh, each phase has a, a, an input parameter named V. I'm just going to assume that you want that connection to happen, and done." But so that's the crux here: is we have one constant V throughout the entire trajectory. Uh, so if you were designing a launch vehicle or an aircraft, this would be a constant parameter associated with the design, like your wingspan uh, or, <clears throat> or your dry mass, something like that. And then we're going to optimize the problem. Oh, I guess one more thing. Here's where, I, so now instead of just guessing values for my first phase, now I have to take the time to guess values for my second phase. And then also critically, I guess, um, in my one phase solution, I had a fixed initial condition on each state variable, and I knew where my final state was. Here, I don't know where my final state is. Um, so I'm going to let Dimos vary the final value of x and y in the first phase. Um, and then in the second phase, I don't know what the initial value of x and y in that phase should be. But because I've linked done the, the link phases together, all it knows is that uh, x in the first phase has to equal x. Uh, final x in the first phase has to equal initial x in the second phase, and the same for y. And then in the second phase, uh, I do know where I'm going to end up. So I can just fix my final value there. Um, so if you, if you miss uh, a connection like this and actually accidentally say, oh, this is true, things are going to go south in a hurry. It's probably going to say it's infeasible. It can't be done. Um, so this is one of the things that you have to be really careful with when setting up problems like this. Are all of my uh, constraints compatible with one another? So there, that's run. It might be hard to see. There's an ever so slight blip up here at the very northernmost extent. Right there, um, the phase switches over from first phase to second phase. One of the things I mentioned, um, I think this might be the last example I have here, and then I'm happy to show you whatever other questions you may have. Um, I mentioned that we do shooting methods. And the way we do shooting methods from a pseudo-spectral context is that, is that the first state variable in the phase, um, so typically if you're integrating forward in time, that would be the first value of your state variable. Um, uh, when we do a shooting method, that becomes the design parameter, the design variable. And all the other variables, all the other state variables uh, in that sequence are essentially controlled by the solver. So we have a solver that goes through and says, OK, I know where you said you wanted to start. Now I'm going to hit all of your, um, all of your final conditions for you. And uh, so this is using a shooting method. So at each iteration here, we have a feasible trajectory. The, sol the solver is going through and converging our variables for us. That addition of the solver under the hood is one of the things that slows us down. If we look at the sparsity pattern of this problem, we're also going to see that it's quite a bit uh, different than the problem had been before. <laughs> Now I don't have any co-location constraints. All of my constraints are of the continuity type um, and, and path constraints. Uh, these are the linkage constraints saying that, uh, yes, your control time and states 
between phase one and phase two have zero difference. Um, but in these shooting methods, where you are at any point in the future depends on where I am now. So I, I, I essentially lose a lot of my sparsity. Um, so I'm only getting 1.8% improvement by using the sparsity coloring algorithm uh, from OpenMDAO in this case. It's just not as good. If I go back and run... Example six. When I was running in the pseudo spectral mode, making sure I defined all my sparsity, as I was getting a ninety-three percent improvement in my sparsity pattern. Um, so yes, it's true, and uh, that OpenMDAO has adjoint mode, and it can more effectively run uh, shooting methods because of that. But um, I still typically find especially in a problem like this, uh, without any implicitness within the ODE, that you're better off um, just using um, a pseudo spectral method. With the exception that if all you care about is analysis and all you care about is getting a converged solution and you don't want to involve the optimizer, then when you have solve segments enabled and you call run model, in the process of doing the run model, all of your solvers are going to converge and you're going to get out a feasible trajectory out of that that's going to match your uh, control profile as long as it's possible to do so given your current grid. So that is what I prepared. Does anyone have any questions? Are there any other examples in the example suite you'd like me to run through? I'm happy to show you whatever you like. Yes. Excellent question. So I saw in both um, uh, talks this morning that, uh, sorry, the question is, is can Dimos uh, perform trajectory optimization where you don't a priori understand the order of your phases? So um, one example in which we encounter this commonly is during a launch vehicle ascent. When do we jettison the shroud or uh, do we jettison the shroud while the second stage is burning or do we jettison it uh, you know, before or after some other event on the vehicle? Um, unfortunately, right now, um, the way this is built, you have to uh, propose the time history a priori. I have, and I don't know if, Daniel, if you've dealt with this, I have some ideas of how we might fix that, um, but that would be kind of a... a yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the topology optimization talks have given me some ideas how I might like essentially use a like density to link those together and force that to happen. But at the moment, no, you have to uh, prescribe that a priori. Yes. So, uh, so Otis comes with uh, very high fidelity, well, 3 off aerospace uh, equations of motion. Um, because of its heritage and because of those inclu the inclusion of those, uh, it's subject to export control in ITAR. And I want this tool to be open, so I don't ever, I don't think I intend to ever include any high fidelity equations of motion with this, other than like the text things out of textbooks and the, the basic example problems. Um, I know uh, one of the hot topics is um, co-state estimation. So when I talked about co-states being not fun to derive, you can approximate those based on the solution. I haven't, generally we're driven by need and I haven't had a need to derive those yet. So um, those are the two that come off of the top of my head. So the mesh refinement was for the pseudo-spectral for both of them? Sorry, sorry, the what? Uh, that mesh refinement works right now under both Gauss-Lobato and Radau. 
Um, I have not put it in to work with RK. Technically, the way RK system works is that each RK um, step, we call a segment to make it kind of c compatible. Again, I feel like it's a little kludgy. And now that we have shooting methods available through the solve segments, I don't know if our RK technique is actually necessary. Any other questions? Yes? I will put this on the docs page. It is not up there yet. Um, so. I like this example a lot better than like the Brick syndrome problem. Because it's, it's more, it seems more relevant, but it's also simple enough that it's it, someone can understand. Well, it's funny because like Eric posed it to me and then I started working on it and then I immediately hit, you know, the, the square root error and the, and the uh, stationary point error. And I was like, oh, this is a really good case to demonstrate because like off the bat, it's like, why isn't it working? Um, so it's nice to have a basic example that encounters problems that you're probably going to see at some point if you're working with Dynos. You have a bunch of other examples. Yes. They are in the they are in the Dynos repository. There's an examples directory under there and then uh, there's documentation um, and we take the open MDO form of documentation where we have effectively like the, the code that you see in our documentation are, are part of our tests so that we can be sure that whenever we push up a new version of Dimos, we're sure that all of our documented tests or documented cases are working because they were tested by the CI. Yeah, I thought I checked yesterday that it was just a Brickhead syndrome one in the GitHub, but then online there was like all these other examples that I was going to do. Okay. Let me just check here. So, Dimos, examples. So. Do you know, you know if this example solves with something other than S and off? Let's find out. That's, <laughs> that's easy enough. That's easy enough to test. So. Yeah, I, I try really hard not to publish too many examples that don't solve with SNOP because I understand not everybody has it. But you also kind of run out of problems that SLSQP can solve at some point. Um, so let's go back to uh, six. It looks like it did. And then if I run the plotting. Yep. So it looks like SLSQP was good enough to solve this. Cool. Yes. Um, slightly different line of question. When you, when you create the conjecture, you give the handle to the other. How, is it possible to specify, is, is there a way to specify Yes. Uh, so we have um, your, the question was when we create the trajectory, uh, you give it the class of, of your ODE. Technically, the, the, we actually do that at the phase level. But the question was if I need other arguments to instantiate uh, the, my uh, ODE system, things that would be uh, options declared and initialized, how do I give those? Uh, we have an argument called ODE init quarks, which is essentially a, a key a key value dictionary of all the arguments you want passed to the ODE. So um, we've used that, like, you know, essentially to toggle at instantiation time, what model do I want to use? And then we can look in there inside the ODE to, to fork off, you know, at instantiation time, how do we want to build this system? And that's an argument to? That's an argument uh, to, uh, to phase. Yes. Um, so probably the best example I have of that, um, when I was racking my brain trying to come up with kind of a, a toy level problem that demonstrated that capability. And it, um, just repeat the question. Uh, sorry, the, the question is, is uh, if we're interested in passing in outside variables to the trajectory optimization, how do we go about doing that? Um, I'm going to pull up in Dimos. 
so I have this example um, where I was trying to figure out what can I design and fly and be a relatively simple problem. So I settled on a cannonball. Cannonball in 2D space is very easy to solve. Um, what's the best cannonball that I can fly in a trajectory subject to the aerodynamic drag and assuming that I have some limit to the energy with which my cannon can kick it. So um, if I pick a, a really big ball, a cannonball, I'll have, you know, um, uh, very uh, a good ballistic coefficient. I'll carry a far direction or a far, a far distance, but I don't have, um, I'm too heavy and the cannon can't throw me as far. So there's probably uh, some combination of uh, what's the best uh, radius of a cannonball um, so that I get a good ballistic coefficient, um, but also I'm, I'm not too draggy. And then also what angle should the cannon shoot me at? Um, so in this uh, example here, I purposely broke this cannonball case into two phases. I have ascent and descent. And then I have this external um, component ahead of that, this external system uh, I'm, that I'm providing a radius and a density. And I believe that's the density of iron, if I remember correctly. Um, and then I uh, add as a design variable, since this is not in a Dymos uh, trajectory yet, uh, this is just a standard OpenMDAO add design bar call. It said, like, pick the best radius for a cannonball that has this density. Um, and then I add my trajectory subsystem. And my trajectory has a lot of design parameters that are not optimized. So that says this trajectory owns this parameter, but I don't want to optimize it. Um, just basically, where does that in-depth var comp live? Um, and here, drag coefficient, lift coefficient, uh, thrust. I have thrust because I'm using the equations of motion uh, for 2D aircraft. I'm just saying thrust is zero. Uh, and alpha is zero, and poof, I have a cannonball. <laughs> and then um, I'm saying, oh, my trajectory also has this input parameter. Um, the input parameter's name, yep, its name is M. Um, and then I connect uh, from my sizing comp, mass goes to the input parameter M, and the external component uh, reference area goes to input parameter S. And if I run that, that uh, it was probably there six months ago, but it's reasonably new. But yeah, so. This is the trajectory. So it basically simultaneously figured out how far can I throw this cannonball and what cannonball can I throw the farthest. So that was my. So if you want to do like a multi mission aircraft optimization or something with like two or more branch trajectories, mm -hmm. would you recommend creating one trash with two linked when, trajectories? When you say. When you say multi-mission, do you mean one mission with multiple branches, or do you mean like multi-point, where I have like two in completely independent well, missions? Let's say we have, you know, a submarine with a mission where you have to escape and a mission where you have to loiter really far. Do you, do you recommend creating one trajectory optic for both of those, or do you recommend creating two trajectory uh, points and running it the way you just showed? I think the official answer is it doesn't matter, but in my brain, each trajectory is essentially a separate vehicle, typically, and then the vehicle design can come in from the outside. But each of those trajectories, like so, if I have one vehicle that's you know uh, going to go to ascent and then perhaps or you know perform an abort, like you know a launch scenario where I have you know here's my due east launch out of out of the Cape and I'm going uh, to launch and then I have a flyback booster come out. How do I optimize that problem? That's one trajectory with a, with a series of branching phases and everything. And then I have a, the separate trajectory, which is like, okay, now my ISS mission that's going up to 51.6 degrees inclination, here's that trajectory. And then I have some commonality in, in as far as the design components that are being saw, sized outside that are going into those. That's in my brain and how it works correctly. I am not gonna say that's the right way or the best way to do it, but that's how I would approach it. Are there colliding Good question. I don't, I, this is an area that we're still getting into as far as like multiple, uh, multiple trajectories is how, how can I best solve each one of those trajectories and still like, to me, it's almost like, I don't like to do CO. I don't, I don't want to have multiple optimizations. So I'm thinking, is there a way where I can quantify cost or something outside and effectively get each one of those trajectories to solve itself optimally, or at least near enough optimal that the global uh, op um, objective function will be satisfied. Um, 
and that that's what I'm thinking right now is perhaps perhaps your um, control variables are more simple, so you just have simple guidance laws um, controlling those trajectories. Um, if you wanted to, you could derive like the two point boundary value problem for these and solve them that way, and then and then effectively um, just meeting certain constraints would would find your optimal trajectory. Not that I'm recommending doing that, but that's one possible approach to, hey, let's let's optimize multiple uh, vehicle trajectories simultaneously to obtain one uh, one essentially overarching objective. You had used the term branch trajectory. And then so I just wanted to address that real quick. If you actually have, say, like one phase that you want shared and then you want to literally branch off of that. So, for example, like an aircraft that's going to take off uh, normally or maybe vertically. And then at that point, you want to consider both entering normal cruise and a two minute hover. Um, so if you're trying to do those kinds of branch trajectories, then those should all be in the same trajectory object. Uh, but if the trajectories really are completely independent, then I think they should be in separate trajectory objects. I, I mean, it is ultimately it's up to you, but that's the way my, my brain would, would do it. Yeah, my brain has problems, though, so can't can't promise that that's the best way. <laughs> you might find it convenient to just put them all in the same trajectory if, like, they had the same names and the same design parameters are going everywhere. That, that there can be lots of phases that don't technically interact with each other at all in a trajectory. That's not a problem. I guess the only other related topic is we now also have something called tandem phases, which are explicitly phases that have the same initial condition and duration but they have separate time discretizations. So they could use either a separate number of nodes or different orders, or even one could use Radau and the other could use gauss lobato um, And we implemented that specifically because we found that, for example, like the ODE for the thermal condition required a different scheme than the ODE for the flight condition. Specifically, the ODE for the thermal condition needed to be much finer discretization than the one for the flight mechanics. Um, so we set those up as separate trajectories and then Dymos has the ability to interpolate between the two grids to kind of pass information between those two. So it is possible to have different time discretizations for different ODEs that then interpolate from each other so that you could, in theory, solve them all together. In, in that situation, for instance, for the thermal phase, in analyzing the thermal system, we need to know how fast we're going. That then comes in effectively as a control. That that phase is not interpolating that as a state. So we pass that in as a control, but that that control time history is effectively the resulting state time history from the previous phase. We just interpolate it onto the same grid that this phase needs it. It comes over, and poof, we have our our necessarily necessary input uh, for our control time history. It's probably easier to show that than it is to. Uh, I'll have to make an example for a tandem phase to demonstrate. Um, with, with Dymos so far, we've admittedly be, been solving much simpler problems, uh, 2D aircraft type problems. That scenario happened all the time with Otis where it was like, okay, how do I, and typically the way we would address it with Otis and, and what I'm working to now is let me, let me run call simulate and get, just guess a control profile and then simulate it out and then take that resulting control time or, uh, state time history and its uh, control time history, interpolate those in as my guess. Now I at least have an initial condition that is a feasible, you know, it's the state history matches the controls at, at, at my starting point, and then it can go from there. That is typically the way we address that with Otis. Um, I don't like not saying that's the right way to do it, but that's, you know, been the way I've done it in the past. So that's probably the way I'd, I'd try. It's for like a roadmap. That's something like like a, a bootstrapping like assist would be would be useful because like the I, I really want to use this for our mission analysis stuff and you know we've been discussing before I just I don't want my users to have to fuck with the guesses yep and so anything that can be done to automate that at all or make it easier would be super helpful. This, I, just, like, I think for your cases the. Yeah. The explicit pseudo spectral methods might be a better way to go. Just let the solver converge it. Yeah. Um, but this, um, it's great though. Like it's it's come to leaps and bounds in the last what, year and a half. Thank you. I, I'm, great. I'm I'm more, so a few things to address that. Um, OpenMDAO has a load case functionality where I can 
where for an open MDAO problem, you can take a previous uh, out of a case recorder, you can say, uh, take case 502 out of this recorder or negative one if it's the, the solution and load it into my problem and poof, now I've instantiated my open MDAO problem where I want it to be. For Dimos, we needed ex almost exactly the same behavior, except we're now potentially changing the order of our, of our transcription. So Dimos, I'm uh, just implemented a load case function uh, that takes a previous solution, and if it's on a different grid, we'll uh, use the interpolate method to interpolate it onto our new space. That seems to work pretty well. Um, I would consider that, uh, along with the grid refinement, to still be like we're still making sure that it, you know we're dotting all of our I's and crossing all of our T's and making sure that they're ready to go. They're in the in the um, uh, repository now though on master so you can play with those if you want so that's as far as as, as far as like loading a previous case to make things easier to work um, it's also possible that starting with a lower order solution while it might not give you the, the exact behavior that you want now that we have um, grid refinement you can start with a lower order solution but possibly get an answer fast and then have it just increase accuracy and increase accuracy um, so, you know, start with an easier problem with fewer variables to solve and, and drive until you get the accuracy that you need. That can help. Uh, we also had a summer intern this year implement uh, an automated scaling technique um, uh, out of Europe uh, by uh, an author named Sagliano uh, that basically looks at your Jacobian matrix and says, oh, here's your Jacobian matrix. Here's here's the order of magnitudes of your projected rows and columns I'm, I'm, or projected rows. I'm going to take that information and essentially use that to scale my input variables, which is one possible way. Um, and so far, and I'm happy to hear any of your experience, but every automatic scaling technique that I've ever seen is heuristic and works great for some things and you know some of them are 80 percent successful and some of them are 10 percent successful um so i've been looking at, at ways of basically doing that and at this point i haven't made the decision whether that should be a generic open mdao capability because i don't think it's completely specific to optimal control or if it's like you know let's just start by putting it in dimos and we'll go from there so those things together should i'm trying i'm to the point now where i'm trying to you know reduce the burden on people because it's it's complicated enough without having to worry about all that stuff. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all. I appreciate it. Uh, Rob very kindly gave you guys 10 minutes back. I'll use just a few of those minutes to thank you guys for coming. I, I really hope this was worth two days of your time. Um, like I said early in the, ro or in the roadmap talk, we're, we're going to try to do this again next year. So if you have suggestions for how we can make it more worthwhile, I'm all ears. Just shoot me an email. Um, I guess everybody get to writing all those poems. I haven't looked at the repository. So for all I know, you could have all written 17 already. Um, but I'll be keeping an eye on that repo in the near future. So thank you guys again for coming. <laughs>